So welcome everyone to lecture number nine. Uh, what we'll do in the next section, we uh, finish the section on the brittle, uh, brittle deformation. And obviously we have to have a section on the ductile deformation. And in between the brittle and ductile, we'll discuss what we are going to discuss today, the deformation at micro scale. Because when we say ductile, it doesn't necessarily imply plastic deformation mechanisms, could be also brittle. Now, brittle deformation mechanisms, we already uh, discussed them, but I'll show them again in this context. Yeah, so we want to see what happens at the micro scale. Once we go through this, we, without too many details, but you have to have an idea of what's going on. Then next term, we'll finish this part, micro scale, and start folds. So we, we will discuss folds a bit, and then we'll end with the shear zones. Then we'll have semana, we'll have a, another test and 50% of the mark. And then we start the second part after the semanas de receso y semana santas. And uh, then it's fun. I think it will be really nice. All right. So um, when we talk about micro scale, we'll look at this deformation mechanisms and these ones are the brittle deformation I'll, I'll show them again and what you see here basically are uh, what we would call um in general like plastic deformation mechanisms they are not brittle yeah so i'll show you what uh, they are about just to remind you you've seen this before yeah you, you you've seen this before but it's very very uh, tractional yeah it's very pedagogical because when we talk about the structural style, just to remind you, if it's brittle and ductile, is how it appears to our eyes uh, in the out at the mesoscale. So if, if you see the joints or fractures or folds, then it's brittle, yeah? But if you see something like as if the rock flowed, then it's ductile. However, we don't know what the mechanisms are, are in terms of at the micro scale, yeah? And if you are here, in the first situation, it's brittle structural style. It looks brittle. And the mechanism is brittle, obviously. But if you are here, it's ductile style. So it, it looks as if, you know, there, there is no loss of cohesion in the rock. But when you look in detail, the mechanisms are still brittle. However, the true uh, situation when you say, well, it's ductile, no loss of cohesion, and you look in detail, and then the mechanisms are here plastic, yeah? And this doesn't exist. It cannot be a brittle style with plastic mechanisms. But you can have a transition between this, between two and three, like both uh, brittle and dark and the plastic mechanisms coexisting, depending in a rock, yeah, in a rock, because the minerals respond at the temperature, yeah? And uh, for the various minerals, the moment when there is a transition from brittle to plastic, uh, depends on the temperature, and the temperatures can be different for different minerals. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. All right. So um, here is something that says strain. So strain. Yeah, the distortion. Yeah, in the rock is accommodated through the activation of one or more deformation mechanisms at the micro scale. Yeah. So let's look at this. Uh, this is taken from the Fawcett textbook. Yeah. So we talk about brittle and plastic deformation mechanisms. And brittle, you've seen what it means. He says, well, it is sudden and violent, yeah, because you break the atomic lattice, yeah? Uh, you break them. Uh, whereas in the plastic, in the case of the plastic uh, mechanism, the change and the distortion is different. So there is no violence here, no breakage, yeah? That's the idea. And here is from a different text, from a different text, so, but for you to, to read. So it says we can classify these deformation mechanisms, for instance, into five ca categories. One would be these this brittle ones. Yeah, we talked about microfracturing, cataclasis, sliding, frictional sliding, and so on. Then you have something called mechanical twinning and kinking. So the, me, uh, the crystals are bent, but they are not broken. Yeah, they bend. And Twinning, you've seen in the mineralogy class, for sure. And then we have something called creep, creep. And there are different types of creep, yeah? That means kind of movement 
without breaking, yeah? So it could, would be something that we call diffusion, something we call dissolution. So uh, fluid is involved, obviously, or something called dislocation. Now the most kind of, <laughs> uh, how to put it, fancy, complicated, but it's this dislocation grip, we'll discuss it next time, yeah? So here, uh, this is a, a text, again, taken from a different text, but I find it instructional. So you can look at something called a deformation map in a simplified form. And what you see here, you see temperature and you see differential stress. So you can see what mechanisms exist at different conditions, like if you have higher temperature and higher differential stress, yeah? So basically, let's look something that you already know, fracture and cataclysis, so all these brittle mechanisms, yeah? So low temperature, yeah, low temperature, and high differential stress, like you have to reach, yeah, you have to, to reach to the limit. What do the limits mean? You mean the limits between, between these fields? Oh, well, they, it's like a map, this one, yeah? In terms of these parameters that you have on the axis, if you find yourself in this point for this temperature and this differential stress, probably this is a dominant uh, mechanism, yeah? If you find yourself here, this is a dominant mechanism. And the limits are, of course, boundaries. It's a simplified map, of course. Uh, at the boundaries, you might have the two of them coexisting, yeah? So that's what the limits are here in this case. Take it as the zones in terms of this space, these two parameters, the zones that are dominated by a certain deformation mechanism at the micro scale, yeah? So that's the idea. So uh, if you have high temperature and relatively not very high differential stress, you'd expect this type of plastic deformation to, uh, to be the one that creates actually the strain, yeah, in the crystals and eventually in the rock. That's the idea. We'll, we'll have a look at all this. Here is a text for you to read. Yeah, I'm not gonna read it now, but I think that what it does, it takes all of this, all of this that you see here and says a bit about each. Uh, I'm not very sure that I got it, Gabriel. Uh, or, uh, you either <laughs> like degraded, well, oh, okay. You wanna know if the boundaries are sharp or not. Um, well, I, I think that, uh, yes, I think that you have some uh, transition. You have some transition, definitely. It, they are not so sharp, the boundaries. So um, the idea is that uh, for each, you have a, a, a bit yeah, uh, written, but I'm gonna show you each of them uh, in a bit. So please uh, take it just for you to, to read it. This. So here is a different way of uh, looking at this mechanism. So we looked at, at them in that kind of map, but here this is taken from the Fossen uh, textbook. So you will see this. So basically you want to think about, uh, you know, the brittle mechanisms and processes and the plastic mechanisms here. Yeah. So this is a limit. Now, you know about this one. So we, we, we discussed this when we talked about the brittle, we talked about the fracturing of the grains, frictional sliding. Then if there is no, no fracturing, there is granular flow like sand flowing, yeah? Um, no fracturing or with fracturing, you have cataclastic flow, which includes all these processes, yeah? It includes grain fracturing, rolling, frictional sliding. So you know about this. I'll show one more slide about this just to remind you. In the case of the plastic, plastic mechanisms, we, we have something that we uh, assign to processes of diffusion. So something moves there in the crystal and we'll, we'll see what, yeah. Um, and something that we call properly crystal plasticity, yeah. So uh, that's basically uh, something that has to do with the deformation, deformation in the crystals, yeah. All right, so let's look at this. Uh, we will not discuss Today, the dislocation creep, we'll leave it for next time because I don't think we, uh, we won't have time uh, and I don't wanna push too much on you, uh, just a bit, yeah? So brittle 
brittle mechanisms, yeah, and the, the formation associated to uh, the the processes associated with these mechanisms, yeah. So you remember this. We 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 uh, you remember this when we discussed about uh, either uh, fracturing of the grains and of more grains. Uh, we discussed about granular flow. Yeah, if there is friction sliding and rolling ro rotation of the grains, but no fracturing or cataclastic flow when these grains or the crystals are, you know, fractured and there is friction sliding along these fractures and so on, like small folds. Yeah. So basically, a situation like this. Yeah, you can see here, including all these things. So. So you have various fractures, yeah, as you can see. So cataclastic flow. So this is a brittle uh, deformation mechanism. And you already know about it. So I'm not going to insist on this because I want to make the transition to the plastic mechanisms, yeah? But before that, just to give you an example. So when you look at the rock and here you, you see the scale independence in geology, uh, something that is not taught in a course per se, we, we don't have we don't have a course in geoscience that is called um, scale independence and fractal uh, aspects in geology. No, we don't have such a course, although it would be an interesting course. So I have to give you bits in this course, maybe in another course and so on. So the idea is that this is the same rock, but the different scales of observation. So this is the outcrop, yeah, and you see it's a cataclastic rock. So there was cataclastic flow here, breakage down to the micro scale. So here is the mesoscale, yeah, the mesoscale. You say, well, uh, this rock obviously suffered brittle, um, brittle deformation, but then you see here is scanning electron microscope image of this rock. So here you can see actually that this was uh, deformed in a brittle manner. You can see that all these uh, crystals are broken. Yeah. And if you take even, so if you look at this, the width of this is 4.3 millimeters. So this is 4.3 millimeters. Now from this one, they took another close up. I don't know exactly where they took it from. And it says 0 0.2 millimeters. So you, if you look at this close up, you again, you can see the actual grains or crystals, yeah, depending on the rock, what it was, that they were broken and they were slide, sliding. Obviously, they were sliding this part relative to this part. This came from somewhere. You see this fold nicely here and so on. So uh, you can see basically a different scales of observation that you keep seeing more or less uh, <laughs> something similar. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Now you are experts in brittle deformation mechanisms. Let's go to the plastic ones. Yeah, let's talk about diffusion. So as you can see, diffusion has some uh, names here. Some is called volume diffusion. Some is called grain boundary, and uh, one type is called wet. Now first we'll talk about these ones too: volume and grain boundary. Yeah. Now this tells you already something in one. Something happens in the volume. And in one, something happens at the boundary. Yeah, what happens? So you learned, I'm, I think, in the mineralogy class, you learned about uh, crystals, and as you know, they are not perfect. Yeah, in the same way we talk that the volume of uh, material of rock is not perfect. Yeah, it has micro cracks. Yeah, it has micro cracks. In the same way, when you look at this really micro, and you look at the crystal structure. Um, uh, what happens, the crystal structure, theoretically, as we imagine it, is perfect, but it has defects, yeah? What could be the defects? Could be that some atoms, yeah, in the structures uh, are replaced by a different type of atoms, uh, by, by, by a different element, which fits in there. So not any element, but some are compatible, yeah, and they can fit. So you can have a substitution, or you can have uh, something within the structure, but interstitial, not occupying one of the nodes of the crystal structure, yeah? So these are two types of defects you probably uh, know about. The other type is called vacancy. So you see the defect here 
is that there should be here, yeah, an atom uh, here, but it's missing. So there is a vacancy. Now imagine that actually the deformation can happen if you start playing a game and there is the migration of the vacancy. So let's say this atom moves here and the vacancy moves here, then this moves here and the vacancy moves here and so on. So this kind of movement of the vacancy through the crystalline structure, yeah, uh, in response to stress in the end, uh, this actually is uh, a type of creep, yeah, we call it creep and it's diffusion creep, yeah, this is a diffusion of the vacancy, yeah, um, and you'll see that this diffusion of the vacancy can happen in the volume or at the boundary, that's why we have two, yeah, so um, you can see the text here, so here I say volume and grain boundary diffusion creep, and the, there are two types of creep, yeah, one is in the volume, like here, this is what it tries to show, vacancies that move in the volume and vacancies that move at the boundaries yeah, of the crystals. So you have volume and grain boundary. And each of these, no, it, no, it's not a brittle deformation process, uh, David, no. Brittle means breakage of the lattice, yeah? So here we talk about soft mechanisms that we, we, all of these mechanisms come under the umbrella that we call plastic deformation mechanisms. So it's the, the other class, yeah? We discussed, we are done with brittle, yeah? We are done with brittle, and now we talk about plastic. So you can imagine, this happens at really the micro scale, at the atomic scale. So this happening at the atomic scale, there is no breakage, yeah? no, no violence here. It happens slowly there, the atoms move around and so on, and the crystal changes its shape. Yeah, look at this, how they deform through this. Let's say you start with this, and under the stress, under the stress, there is uh, the stress promotes this creep. Yeah, so the two, the two types of creep, this diffusion creep, we have two types, one happens in the volume, like here, like, like what I showed you here, like in the volume, yeah? And one happens at the margins, yeah? So, but the idea is the same. The vacancies, yeah, where you have this defect that we call a vacancy, there is an atom missing, they migrate, yeah? And an atom comes in, in the place, it's like playing a game. And the two types of creep, diffusion creep, uh, have two names, one is, volume diffusion, because it happens in the volume, and one is grain boundary, it happens at the margins, yeah? So the blue arrows here represent the grain boundary, the black arrows uh, represent movement in the volume. Or they have some names based on the names of people who studied this, yeah? Uh, and you see this kind of name, so, so uh, you'll find them in the textbook, okay, uh, these names. So, you see volume diffusion, so the vacancy moves through the crystals. Uh, you, as you can see, it's a relatively slow process, not very high uh, rate, yeah? You see a few centimeters per million years. This is really slow. <laughs> so now, um, and in this case, as I said, vacancies move along grain boundaries. In both types of these uh, processes, yeah? the mineral grains change shape, yeah? So as the mineral grains change shape, mesoscopically, we see the distortion, yeah? So basically, this is, uh, these are two of the uh, processes that make it happen without breaking the material, yeah? Um, as you can see, there are these studies, again, it's a whole field. I'm not an expert in it, there are people who studied this and you wouldn't even know, call them geoscientists. They are basically physicists, basically, yeah, who actually uh, study this. But uh, as you can see, there are many parameters to take into account and it says the grain size yeah, is important, for instance, 
for the volume diffusion creep. The smaller the grains, the higher the strain rate. Yeah. So it's a whole domain of inquiry, this one. So on the map showing you, yeah, the volume diffusion creep is here. Yeah. So you need a relatively high temperature, yeah, relative to the others for it to happen. A bit less temperature for the grain boundary diffusion to happen. Yeah. So this would what would happen, you see, just theoretically as an idea. You have the principal stresses here, you see sigma one and sigma three, and the vacancies from the volume try to go to the margins and the atoms uh, uh, migrate in the places of the vacancies. Yeah. And through this process, there is a change in the shape. And this is a strain ellipse. Yeah. For this crystal, for instance, the initial state and the final state. Yeah. It deforms but it deforms slowly through this internal process. Now, here is something from another text, but for you to play the game, if you want to follow A, B, C, D, E, F, and read this. So this is a vacancy and you, it's like playing a game. Yeah, you, you can see uh, the vacancy moves here and this atom moves here. And then the vacancy moves here and the atom moves here and so on up to the point that you end up with this, you start with this yeah, crystal lattice and you end up with this. Yeah, it is a game. You can imagine, you can ask a computer to, to actually um, model this yeah, and simulate this. All right. Now, grain boundary diffusion. Grain boundary diffusion, I already discussed it, but on the map sits here for these two parameters that are very important, differential stress and temperature. Yeah. Um, and what happens, the diffusion, there is promotion of the diffusion along the boundary. So you see the temperature activates these mechanisms. So you need the highest temperature to activate the volume diffusion, to make things move in the volume. A bit less temperature, so uh, yeah, to make them happen at the boundaries. Yeah, so th that tells you something. It tells you that there is more energy required to make it happen in the volume than to make it happen at the boundaries. Yeah, that's the idea in the end. And this just shows you what, what would happen, this diffusion of atoms on grain boundary and the change, the change uh, of shape, yeah? Slowly, uh, of course, slowly, um, but the change of sh shape, so that's what, the transformation from of the this circle into the strain ellipse. Yeah, that's the idea. Now, so we talked about this <laughs> diffusion, volume, and grain boundary because of vacancies. Okay, there is a, another type of diffusion creep, which is called wet diffusion creep, or dissolution creep, or pressure solution. The one I like it most is called pressure solution and maybe dissolution creep to, uh, to make it clear that it's different from the others, but pressure solution, you'll, you'll encounter it a lot in the literature. So imagine that the changes, yeah, the, the movement happens also at the boundaries. Yeah. So it's kind of similar to the cobalt creep, yeah, to the grain boundary um, diffusion creep. So I, I say here that geometrically, so geometrically what happens with the change of shape and so on, and mathematically, it can be treated in the same way. Yeah? But what happens here, you can imagine that the diffusion, that means the movement of the atoms is facilitated by a thin film of fluid. So we have fluid in the geological environment, yeah? We have fluid. And if there is a thin film, this facilitates this type of diffusion. Imagine that you have the solution where you can dissolve, if you want, a bit of material. And then the dissolved material can go elsewhere. Yeah, that's the idea. That's why it's called pressure solution or dissolution. Dissolution means it's dissolved, yeah? The dissolution creeps. So the material, yeah. Um, uh, basically is dissoluted yeah, in this thin film of fluid. And you see what happens 
to the atoms that got into the fluid. They will precipitate. Now, they can precipitate, they can move from here to here, yeah, on the sides. And with time, there is a change in the shape, but the fluid can take them out of the system far away. And this is a mechanism uh, that accounts for what we call chemical compaction. Yeah. So let's say you have a sedimentary basin and the sediment gets buried, yeah, the sand, and then it becomes sandstone. So some of the material will get dissolved and will become cement, yeah, will will basically glue the grains. And some will go out of the system, yeah, out of the system, and the rock becomes more compact than the initial sediment. So this compaction, we call it chemical compaction. And this is a mechanism that explains it, yeah? So that's why it's a very important mechanism in geology pressure solution. And here on the map, you see you don't have a high, you need to have a high temperature, it exists. All you need to have is uh, you have this stress at the interaction of grains. So it, it forces the material to dissolve a bit into that fluid, yeah? And here is, for instance, dissolution showing you where it can happen, yeah? Dissolution, the, uh, where, the, where the material gets dissolved, like at the interaction of grains, for instance, yeah? Or along fractures, whatever. Then you have fluid transport. The fluid transport can be out of the system, can be, not always, but it can be, um, it, it happens along fractures, for instance. It happens through pore space, yeah? So this all can be combined, all this. The deposition can, can be in the system, yeah, on the same mineral grain, but on the sides, on other mineral grains, in some fractures. So when we look at fractures, and we said that basically we have, we have uh, minerals that fill the fracture, we call those fractures veins, very important in mineral exploration, veins, quartz veins, calcite veins, yeah? Sometimes they have gold, yeah? But that material that was precipitated, where does it come from? So you can imagine in, an, in rocks that suffer metamorphism, yeah, it, you have high pressure, high temperature and so on. You can imagine this process basically dissolving part of the material and uh, the fluids come on fractures and at some point where the chemical conditions are favorable, they precipitate the material, for instance, yeah? So also in the pore spaces, and uh, this material dissolved forms the cement, and that's the process of lithification of the sediments. So you see, we, we learned something very abstract, very boring, but at the same time, now we can have, we can understand some geologic processes that we can observe when we go and look at the rocks. All right, now, uh, here is just an example, again, taken from another text, because I think it's a good example uh, showing you, uh, for instance, you have, you, you see here the stresses, yeah? And you see the interaction of these grains, yeah? These mineral grains. And this is where you have high compressive stress, yeah? And it says here that grain D, grain D is a strong and insoluble grain. So this will not dissolve, but these ones, they will, yeah, around here. So you see pressure solution acts here. So that the thin film of fluid uh, uh, starts getting atoms from these grains, yeah. So, it, uh, so basically, and takes out uh, material. And then because the grains change shape, the grains change shape, you can see that basically the surface of interaction gets actually larger, yeah? Initially, they have a little of interaction here, then more interaction, then even more interaction. And as they do this under this stress situation, yeah, you see the maximum stress here, the whole zone, the whole volume is compressed, yeah? So basically, what I want you to observe here, yeah, when you look at the strain ellipse, there is no lateral, so the, you deform this, but it doesn't change shape so that it expands yeah, laterally because the material was taken out of the system in this case. So basically it was shortened, the volume, 
yeah, under the high sigma one, but the material that was dissolved was taken out of the system and precipitated everywhere, elsewhere in a vein, for instance, uh, elsewhere. And here you see what the strain ellipse would look like. Yeah, so very interesting. Uh, that's why I included this. All right, so finally, I think I gave you a, a lot of information. I don't wanna push too much, but finally you'll find in the book <laughs> something called super plastic creep. Uh, at high temperature, yeah, at high temperature, there is this situation that basically the crystals they change, uh, they 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 change shape by sliding. They it's called grain boundary sliding. But this is basically a process facilitated by grain boundary diffusion. Yeah, so there is no breakage, no gap that forms. Yeah. So it looks as if if the grain as if the grains slide one against the other and they change shape. So you can start with something like this and end up with something like this. Um, so you have all these diffusion mechanisms at the boundaries, like dry, yeah, grain boundary dif diffusion, the cobalt creep, or the wet diffusion, the the pressure solution acting, yeah, and combining to create this, and we call this super plastic creep. It is in the textbook, just to read it, uh, but if you know the other mechanisms that we discussed, that's fine. So finally, and uh, we discussed about the diffusion, yeah, these diffusion processes. You know, now you, you can recognize them. Now, they come under the umbrella of plastic flow, but there is something called crystal plasticity, yeah? this deformation actually. So until now, the deformation happened because the atoms moved in this way, yeah, they were transported. Now we have some deformation. So let's twinning, and next time we'll talk about the dislocation creep. Uh, the twinning, I think you studied it in mineralogy. I don't know exactly what Marcos does in mineralogy. And also there is the laboratory component in mineralogy. And if you had the chance to do mineralogy before the pan pandemic, yeah, pandemia, then you had a normal laboratory class and you must have looked at uh, uh, crystals of uh, calcite that have, uh, that are twinned and they look like this, yeah, in the, uh, under the microscope, yeah, or plagioclase, first of all, plagioclase, they have twins. So basically, uh, under stress, you see sigma one, and at 45 degrees, yeah, at 45 degrees relative to sigma one, uh, on those planes, we have the maximum shear. As we, we have seen the function, we know already this. So what happens, there is basically this bending, mechanical bending, yeah, of the crystal lattice. So it doesn't break, it doesn't break. So it's not a brittle mechanism. It doesn't break, it just bends or kinks. And you, and especially in the case of calcite and plagioclase feldspar, you will see this uh, happening. And you see crystallographically speaking, you have some very clear angles, like it happens at 45 degrees relative to sigma one. And you have this bending as you can see it, yeah. Uh, at 38 degrees here. All right, so this is twinning, mechanical twinning. Uh, it happens even at low temperature, yeah, low temperature uh, as a process. It's a plastic, a plastic mechanism, yeah, for instance. All right, so this is it for today. Uh, reading assignment, I give you these pages only from this textbook. If you want, Optionally, if you want to look in the other textbook, um, how they do not break, it's like bending something. If you take a material and you, you bend it, it's just that, that you can imagine the lattice like this with the atoms, and they kind of move the angle relative to, to the others, but they don't break, they don't slide one against the other. Yeah, It's just that, uh, imagine a rectangular rectangular lattice, and you take some that, you know, from a certain level, 
they bend. So the atoms will be at a certain angle relative to the other atoms, yeah? That's the idea. It, it's like having a straight line and you take, and you take like this is my finger and you take, you know, uh, a segment of it and you rotate it, yeah? That's Gabriel. So what I was saying is if you want to look in the other textbook, uh, it is, you know, at a level that is, <laughs> all right, exactly, Gabriel, at a level that is kind of more advanced, yeah? So I didn't want to scare you in any way, but if you want to understand the process as it is explained there, you are more than welcome to do it, but you don't have to do it. If you read from chapter 10, these pages, I am more than happy, okay? So this is it for today. Um, I'm gonna stop this and I'm wishing all of you, uh, you know, Feliz uh, Tarde and nos vemos jueves. Y si ustedes quieren poner preguntas, todo, yo estoy aquí para ustedes. Ahora, gracias a todos.